Okay. Um, let me move this out of the way too. All right. So uh, again, like last time, what we're going to do is we're just going to give a, a really fast run through the entire lecture and just hope that uh, you guys get it, uh, enough of it. I'm going to run through the pre and then for the post, we'll try to get uh, after we answer some questions. Okay. If there's time. All right. So if you have any questions or anything of that sort, please go to your participants list and um, uh, tell me or unmute. Uh, if you're all okay and you're with me and you're following, please give me a yes sign so I know that you're alive and well. I can't actually see any of you because you have all of your cameras off and because I'm in screen share mode, I can't see you anyways. So uh, Chi Hong, you have your microphone on. Do you have anything you want to raise up? No? Okay, I have a couple people who said uh, they're okay. So I, I'd like to see a couple more people say that they know what's going on. Okay, great. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so I hope you in, enjoyed tutorial last week, right? Uh, we have Kahoot and we're gonna try to do that every week as, as much as we can so to get you energized. We really do have to master uh, being able to learn uh, through an e-learning style, whether it's synchronous or not. I hope you appreciate the amount of effort it takes to uh, produce a video. It does actually take somewhere around 10 times the amount of time to actually record and sync and all, on doing all that. And you'll appreciate it yourself because you're gonna have to produce your own video for your projects. Okay, uh, enough me uh, ranting. So let's go through Naive Base. Okay, so uh, the Naive Base algorithm is really simple. Okay, let me try to bring this up a little bit more. So we have uh, three parts of the equation, the, um, as it says here, the likelihood, right, of this area over here, uh, which is uh, what's the likelihood of the data given that I know the class is a certain value. So uh, given now I know it's raining outside or given that I know you like uh, a particular drink, what's the data that um, uh, I'm presenting? What's the drink on the table? Or, or um, are you coming in with a wet umbrella? Or something like that, right? There's also the prior, right? The prior is how probable uh, that particular class is out of all of the other classes. So it doesn't have to be a Boolean example. It could be other things, but uh, of course here, we've chosen Boolean values uh, to make it a little easier uh, when we're talking about things. Okay, um, then we have the marginal, um, as we saw, okay, also uh, right here. I just see whether I can erase that. Nope. Let's see, I don't know why it doesn't let me do things properly. Okay. Okay, anyways, hopefully we, we'll get away from this. Um, so we have the marginal, right, which is basically the probability of the data. And uh, we've talked about this a couple of times. Why is the probability of the data important? Well, it's important for showing equivalence, right? We can only write this, uh, this equal sign if we actually have all three of these terms, right? But many times we don't have to care about the data because the data is actually given to us, right? Um, it's the, the piece of evidence that we want to classify. So somebody gives you an image or somebody gives you a drink and you say, do you like it or not? Okay, whether it's probable or not, you, it's not of consequence to us, right? So um, that's a very important thing. When we also talk about you know, uh, evaluating the test, um, accuracy of a learner. We also talked about, you know, the likelihood of the data, right? Meaning we have this expectation of performance over unseen samples, right? So there will be cases in many cases where there's bias in our data set in the sense that there are certain examples that are more likely than others, right? In Singapore, maybe it's very unlikely to have an earthquake, but it could happen it's very unlikely that there will be a terrorist attack, but it could happen, okay? So on a normal day when we're trying to predict traffic or, or anything of that sort, you know, a regular occurrence, we are going to favor uh, making sure our test performance is in line with the distribution of data that we normally see, right? So that's why um, this P of uh, X is down there. And it's also why when we talk about evaluation of test data, we have to worry about that, right? because uh, we are not considering all of the different uh, values the same way. Okay, I can't get this thing to disappear. So I'm going to, um, let's see, throw away my annotations and come back. Uh, it's the ink annotations here. Okay, so I'm gonna reopen that. I was using uh, PowerPoint's annotation rather than um, Zoom's annotation. Okay, uh, that was the wrong deck. Okay, here we go. Uh, 
All right, so everyone's okay with that. So we'll go on. So uh, you guys all know the probability uh, chain and product rules. So I'm not gonna go over that. The only thing important there is that you can factorize any way you want. And uh, again, naive Bayes is naive for the very simple idea that uh, we're thinking of things as conditionally independent. And if you want to make naive Bayes less naive, you can decide some other factorization. So you could say, for example, hey, I know that X1 and X2, the first two components of my X vector, they're highly correlated, okay? So I need another term. I, I'm not gonna use these as separate. Maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna join them together in some way. So I have P of X1 comma P of X2, uh, without the P, sorry, you know, just putting them together, you know, something like this, okay? Well, not with a dot, okay? As a, uh, as a joint probability, and I'm gonna use that to model something, okay? Uh, because I don't believe they're actually independent of each other, right? So that's a way to make it less um, naive, right? You, you're saying you're specifically accounting for um, things that are, are, are correlated with each other, right? Okay. So when we go through the trace of naive Bayes, hopefully everyone understood this. This is fairly easy. It's just counting, right? And uh, you guys asked about what's the change in this moving, so we'll get to that in the post part of the lecture. So you count everything, and then you just need the three components as usual, right? You will need your uh, likelihood, you're gonna need your prior, and uh, you're gonna use that uh, uh, with, sorry, your prior as well as uh, your class probability, right? Uh, so these three things are going to go in uh, to calculating the actual sum, uh, so actual probability, but of course we're going to ignore uh, the likelihood uh, the, the marginal, the, the, like, the, the probability of the data, and we'll just take uh, these two terms over here, okay? All right, so we'll go ahead. So once we have all of this, we can just simply apply naive Bayes. We have, um, you know, basically one statement for each of the different, um, terms, right? So for each feature, I'm going to need a term, and then I'm going to need uh, the prior, right? The prior will depend on how many classes there are in the data set. Here, we just have a, a Boolean case, so we only have two, right? Okay. Okay, I am going to put this in presentation mode, so it's uh, a little easier um, uh, otherwise. Okay, let's see. View. Have to move this ruler out of the way. Um, come on, slideshow. Oh, it's on the wrong screen. Sorry. Let me let me not do that. Okay, I gotta get these things figured out better next time. Uh, and slideshow. Okay. Anyways, let's go on. So uh, once we do all of that, uh, we, we get out a, um, a probability after we have done the normalization. So a couple people asked, do I need to do normalization or not? Uh, can, I mean, from this, I already know that this probability is a lot higher. So why, why can't I declare victory just with that? And, and the answer is you can, you, you can certainly do that. You don't need to uh, normalize, especially if you have a lot of uh, classes that can be a bit tedious to do. Um, but many times you actually want a probability out because uh, sometimes your learner is not the only thing that's going on. Uh, you may actually use the output of this learner as input to another learner and that's called stacking. Um, it's a fairly, uh, uh, it's used all the time in neural networks. So you stack uh, classifiers on top of each other. And so uh, it's often very important to try to get uh, a probability out. So um, actually doing this normalization can be very tedious and actually can be a very big bottleneck for certain types of uh, probability-based uh, classifiers. But in, in the version that we're talking about here, it's not a big deal because it's just a number of classes, okay? If you have thousands or millions of classes in some types of problems, like for example, predicting what the next word in a sequence is, okay, in natural language, something like that will happen, then basically all of the possible words that you can say are each a class, right? So if you can think of the English dictionaries having maybe 30,000 words, okay, then you have 30,000 classes and you have to compute uh, this sum for all 30,000 things and then divide all 30,000 probabilities 
by that sum. So it gets uh, tedious, okay, and, and difficult to do. Okay, so um, there are some problems. Uh, so if we uh, go to the post part of the lecture, it doesn't handle zero. So uh, I think it's, it's better to take them all in one shot. So we'll just go directly to that. Okay. So when we talk about smoothing, it's basically the same thing, right? We have this uh, nasty zero sitting here, okay? So when we get this zero, as soon as we multiply it in any test example, right? So we have a test example here, we're going to hit this zero, right? So um, uh, uh, outlook overcast, okay? As soon as I see this um, for a no case, which is the one down here, right? this one down here, it's going to result in the zero. So that's no good for us. Uh, we're going to have problems with that. So we need to smooth, okay? So what's the point about smoothing, okay? What are we trying to do with smoothing, okay? Is it Hello. that we're trying to um, Sorry, add I... data to the data set? Go ahead, yeah. No, no, I think you're not sharing your screen. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know what happened there. Thank you. Thank you, you bro. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was not paying attention. This is one of those things. Okay, can, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please bring that up. Okay, so um, hopefully you guys got this idea that uh, we are at uh, this case where we have a bunch of zeros uh, coming from this particular case, right? Where we have no observations of it being overcast outside and not playing golf. Okay, everyone with me? If you're with me, please uh, put a yes sign up. Okay. Okay, so I want to ask you a quick question while you're doing that. Okay, why are we doing smoothing? Is it because we want to add data because we don't have any? Or is it because we don't have sufficient data and we'd like it not to get a zero? And uh, what's our purpose? For, for doing that. So I'm going to ask you purpose later. So if you think it's to add data artificially, um, then you can type yes. If you think it's to um, be able to calculate a probability uh, without needing to acquire more data, then type no. Okay, so you can do either yes or no, right? Either one of these is fine. Okay, I just want to check your understanding. Why, why are we doing that? Okay. Okay, many of you are putting on chat. That's fine too, that's great. Okay, so most people said no. Uh, we're, we're doing this to handle the problem with having not enough observations. And you'd be right, okay? If you guessed yes, that's also you know, somewhat accurate, but not the whole statement. Usually we don't want to touch our data. We want to add um, any little amount of information that we can handle um, sparsity, okay? Meaning we don't have enough data. Okay, so uh, many times we ask ourselves, how much smoothing do you want to do? So in this particular exercise, what we saw is we can add one, right? We just said for every particular observation, uh, we're just going to add one to it, okay? So, um, so this zero becomes a, a one, and then we have to recalculate our denominator for this case. So we had originally 14 uh, things here, right? Um, and then now we've added another six false hallucinated entries. So now I have 14 plus six or 20, 20 elements in this table, right? So that's the 12 plus the eight, okay? So that's what we're doing. Uh, we have to do this in order to get a probability calculation, okay? We're not trying to actually change the output in a way that's uh, going to make the predictions vary a lot. The problem is, like we've highlighted on this die example, okay, when you look at a, a normal six-sided die and you roll it one time, you're gonna get a number, right? And the question is, do we actually really think that that number is gonna come up every time, right? From a maximum likelihood standpoint, we only have one observation. So that makes the most sense. The next number should be a five, right? If, if I take this example here, okay, that I, I rolled a die for the first time. Okay, so when we have sparse data and we, you know, we don't believe that that data really indicates the whole existence of our data set, then we often smooth. And then we have to figure out what type of smoothing to apply. Okay, so in this particular case, when we are smoothing by adding values uh, for every conditional and every part of the prior, 
then what we are doing is we're thinking of it as a uniform distribution. That means every possibility is equally likely, right? Because, well, we added one for everything, okay? If you believe for some reason that some things are more likely than others, then you may not want to do that, okay? So, for example, uh, if you think about language, right? So that's the uh, area of study that I do. Uh, language has a per particular probability uh, um, phenomenon, right, that certain words are more common than others, right? So function words like of, a, and, uh, the, they're, they're more prominent, okay? So these words are going to be more likely. We wouldn't want to say every word in the dictionary is equally likely, right? Then we would want to smooth it differently, okay? But here in add one smoothing, we just want to solve the problem of having sparse data, solve the problem, uh, perhaps not very accurately, just so that we can multiply all the numbers together. Okay, so what's different about this part from the previous version of the deck is that uh, we're adding one to everything here, which is the same, but we're also doing it differently for each table. Okay, so if you go down to the next uh, set of slides here, okay, you can see that the denominators have changed. Okay, and why is that? Because if you look at the contingency table for humidity and windy, there are only two values, okay, like um, humidity is only high or normal, and windy is either true or false. So that means instead of having two free rows here, we only have two, okay? That means when we add, we're going to only add four entries to our table instead of having more, and that means we get a different number, okay? So um, that's the reason why these numbers are a little bit different uh, than before, okay? And so when we do that, uh, uh, our prior is also going to change. So we have two versions of the prior, uh, probability of yes or no. We're just gonna add one to each one, okay? You can see this is some type of uniform distribution. If I didn't have any observations, I would say it's equally likely to like a drink or not like a drink or to play golf or not play golf, okay? So um, the only difference between the previous version and this version is that we are smoothing per table, okay? So each of the conditional probability tables is smoothed individually, and our priors are also getting smoothed, and they're also adding one, okay? Then we'll get the, the output as, as you see here, okay? So that's the, the big one for this, all right? All right, so uh, with uh, Laplace smoothing, basically what we are doing is we're changing the probabilities a little, okay? We call it also in machine learning discounting, okay? So um, you, you don't think about it in terms of like a sale or something. It means taking some probability mass from the actual observations and cutting them off, right? Because originally my denominator was out of uh, um, 14, because I had 14 days, but now it's out of 20. That means each of the individual data instances that were real, these three, this four, this two, this two, this three, they're being, um, you know, a little bit of, uh, of it is being cut off and being assigned to these uh, uh, artificial instances, okay? So I hope you, you got that all, um, uh, understand the uh, explanation for that. So if you understood, uh, again, uh, please give me a thumbs up or uh, you can, again, write up in uh, the, uh, ask me anything, okay? And uh, I'll be happy to go over that again. So um, you can either put it in chat or you can use your participants list and, and let me know whether you understood that. You know, either I got it or I still don't get it. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Okay, I, I only see a, a couple of you, so uh, I'm assuming some of you are still lost. So if you're lost, please come and uh, ask more questions on the Ask Me Anything, and I'll, I'll cover that again later. Okay? All right, great. So um, next what we're going to do is go over nearest neighbors. Okay, so uh, we're going to do the pre part and then the post part. So uh, we'll do both. Okay. Where is my slide deck? Uh, okay, there it is. So a nearest neighbor, again, it's an analogizer. You heard this from Pedro, right? So Pedro said uh, there are five tribes of machine learning. An analogizer says something is the same if it is, something belongs to a class if it exhibits similar properties to something I already know, right? 
So uh, I'm going to do this by looking at uh, uh, my data that I have already in my data matrix and assigning it to the closest neighbor that I want. Okay, so that's really easy. Um, many of you asked about uh, in the collab notebook and also in uh, course homology, right? Why it is that we have two different right answers for this, you know, what is the complexity of training? Okay, so I want to go over that with you. Okay, basically, we can consider when we don't have any data in our memory at all. Okay, then we have to load the whole thing in, right? That means we have to load the whole data matrix. Uh, each entry is of size M and we have N of those. So it's a quadratic, right? I, if I think of it in the number of uh, individual feature values, okay? But there are also many times, uh, okay, so that, that answer is correct. You know, you can say it's quadratic in N and M, okay? But we can also say it is constant time and that is because of the setting, right? There are some cases in which we actually already have all the data in memory and we need to make a calculation. Okay, so for example, uh, I commented on some of your uh, uh, assessments when we have, for example, streaming data. Okay, so um, we, we are keeping track of uh, the past uh, instances that have already come in memory. We have them all loaded up in our data table and there's a new instance coming in. Uh, what do I do with that? Um, I have to classify it. Well, I've already have all of my memory uh, full populated with all of the data and I need to make a uh, you know, assessment of that. So um, unlike other types of machine learning algorithms that have a parameterization, right? That means they're parametric, right? They have a theta, you know, some way of representing the model. Uh, KNN doesn't, right? NN doesn't, okay? So nearest neighbor just says, okay, well, I, I don't even need to bother with that. I'm just going to look at what's nearby my data instance, draw a circle around it, and then say that's the, that's the answer, right? Whatever is in the inside, okay? And so for all, all of that, we basically need some type of uh, distance metric, right? So we have a distance metric here, um, which is for pixel values, for example. And uh, this just computes an L1 distance metric. So for that particular pixel, how far in a single dimension is it from the right answer, right? So I'm gonna take the, the, the pixel value of my test instance, subtract it by the pixel value of the same corresponding pixel in my training data for training data number one, for example, and then calculate an absolute value. Sum these up, right? Sum these up over uh, many different uh, instances and then uh, get a final number out, right? So this is the 456, okay? And whichever number is the lowest in my data set, that is going to be the answer that we want, okay? So I, if I use two input features, I'm gonna get something uh, that I can shade. So each of the points here represents a, a single class, uh, an instance that's tied to a particular class, maybe red, maybe blue, or maybe green. And then when I uh, pick a particular spot on this plane, I already know what it's going to be classified as, right? So either I can keep all the points in memory or, you know, analogously, once I have all the points, I could keep the boundaries of these uh, polygons, right? These are gonna be high dimensional polygons if I have more than two features, right? And I'm going to use this to define um, where things are, right? If I do that, then I actually have a theta, right? I have a model representation. The, the model representations are these polygons, right? But if I run k nearest neighbors or nearest neighbors without that, just storing the data instances, that's fine too, right? Because I, I will be able to figure out for any one point in this uh, plane, what is the nearest neighbor to it? Okay, so you can sometimes convert a non-parametric learner into a parametric learner by keeping uh, an idea of the decision boundaries. In fact, um, this week when you go to linear classifiers, you know exactly what we're doing. We're trying to find a line and that line is the decision boundary that is the parameterization. So you can think about how complex is the hypothesis that KNN is coming up with. It's really, really, really complex, right? Look at this diagram. How many line segments did I need to draw this picture? Okay, a lot, okay? so it's a lot more complex, okay? In some cases, infinitely more complex than a linear classifier, okay? Because there's so many different polygons that I can, and can draw dependent on the data set. Okay, 
So um, that is basically K and N. All right, we talked about it uh, being uh, parameter free. And I also asked you to think about this. Uh, you know, we've asked this a couple of times on midterms and things of this sort, um, you know, because of this big problem about the testing time, right? Uh, it might be really nice to be able to say, oh, okay, I'm done training very quickly. In fact, many of you, when you train your deep neural networks, it could take days, right? So KNN, you never have to wait. You just are finished automatically once you have the data loaded in, okay? But then to apply, um, it's not very effective, right? So you can think of it, the more data you accumulate, the slower your algorithm runs to figure out a test instance. Isn't that terrible? I mean, if you were Lazada or your C or Microsoft or Amazon and you are just getting troves and troves of data, every time you get more data, it's going to slow your algorithm down, okay? So we would need some way to make it a little faster, okay? So how could you speed this up, okay? So that's something I'd like you to think about. If you have answer to that uh, and you wanna uh, you know, get some feedback, you can also put it in the ask me anything. So uh, hopefully, you remember uh, where that is, uh, it's over here. So this poev.com, K-N-M-N-Y-N, that's just my name without my vowels, and then uh, you can write it up there, okay? All right, so then I'm also gonna cover a little bit of the K nearest neighbors from the post lecture, and then I'm gonna answer some of your questions because I can see they're somewhat stable now, all right? Okay. So in K nearest neighbor, there's only one hyperparameter, okay? It's the idea of being able to choose uh, how many neighbors you want to consult, right? So great minds think alike, and maybe instead of talking to one friend, you talk to a whole bunch of friends to see whether that guy or that girl is worthwhile dating, et cetera, okay? So uh, like many other things in life, you might want to decide, right, rather than sit on the fence. So you might choose K to be an odd number, so you consult an odd number of neighbors and then uh, you go with the majority, right? So we don't have to uh, worry about ties that way, okay? There are other ways that you can break ties that we're gonna cover in tutorial. So if you've had a look at the tutorial questions, you can start to think about that, okay? So when we are setting K, um, I hope you realize by looking through the slide in the lecture notes that you can see what's going on, right? A smaller K, as we saw in our uh, pre-lecture, uh, happens to be a space that is uh, very jagged, right? You have these uh, very uh, rigid line boundaries, all right? Um, they're straight lines, right? That uh, denote the midpoint bisector between two individual points, right? And uh, it creates this uh, Voronoi tessellation of the space. When we get larger Ks, we're still doing that. We still have line segments, but they become a little bit um, more smooth right? So you can see as we progress from um, on the left side all the way to the right over here, um, it becomes a little bit more uh, nicely uh, put together, right? Okay, so that uh, looks uh, nicer. So you can think about why would we want to use a small k or a big k? Okay, there are lots of reasons, right? If you use a large k, well, maybe not, not so good because now I have to calculate, you know, what are the k nearest neighbors, right? Rather than the one best. Right, and so those of you who studied uh, algorithms, you know a way to find the top k or the uh, uh, bottom k of something. It's called a priority q or heap, right? A heap data structure. So you can use this to keep track of the the top uh, closest points, k points, and then use that after you've gone through the entire data set to decide. Okay, so it could be more complex. Uh, in calculation, but we get a smoother surface. So for example, here, uh, you can see there's this one blue point out there and there's some blue points in the middle here. And uh, if we really think those are correct, then fine. But if we think that maybe there's some measurement error in our data, maybe it would make a little bit more sense to, to use something else, right? So we, we'll use something like this, uh, where we have a bigger K and we were just saying, well, you know, sometimes I wasn't able to measure the class effectively. So that's the noisy target, right? If it was noisy data, that means, uh, you know, some of these positions of these points are off, not their label, okay? So those are two different concepts. They, they're of course related to each other, okay? So when I have a higher K, uh, there's more computation involved, but I am able to discard outliers or noisy measurements or noisy class labels more effectively, okay? 
So um, we also covered this about uh, what is a perfect performance. So we need another way to judge performance than just whether the one accuracy on the training data makes sense, right? So we want to look at uh, cutting up our data set in some other way and deciding what we mean by a good performance measure. Okay, now we talked about distance metrics um, and, and cost functions and they're uh, often related because we can use distance for KNN, but we use loss to also think about how well we're doing on the data set. So these two things are, are basically very similar. Distance measure uh, says what's the uh, similarity between two instances, right? But a cost function measures how well we're doing uh, our current set of parameters for an algorithm or hyperparameters. How well is that choice in making a good performance on our training data? Again, we, we have testing data that we really care about, but we don't have labels for them. So there's no way we can tell whether we're right or not, right? It's sort of like doing a question paper without a solution key. Well, maybe you know uh, some, some particular question is hard, but you cannot tell whether your answer is correct or not, okay? So uh, the only thing we can do is say, uh, for example, is to take some of the past year papers, hide the answers, don't look at them, uh, try them out as if we were testing and then look at the answer, okay? That's called validation. So we'll cover that in, uh, in a while, okay? So uh, that's basically the uh, reason why uh, we do all of these uh, different things. And um, I think we also hit upon this part where we talked about distance measures, um, not necessarily doing as, uh, uh, as well as we'd like, right? So um, if you just use a, a very simple threshold, then all of these different uh, ones here, the boxed, the shifted, and the tinted one would have the same uh, L1 pixel difference, right? So the boxed one is exactly the same as the original, except we remove the eyes and mouth. The shifted means we move everything off uh, a couple pixels to the left or the right, and tinted means we change all of the pixel values by some HSV value a little bit. Okay, so this one looks a, blue, a bit blue tinted, okay? So um, this is why we need to use the right distance metrics, okay? If you've uh, listened to uh, this week's intro uh, from Chen Su Han, he says that you need to know your data. You really need to know your data, okay? So uh, as you go into your projects and you uh, acquire data sets, you need to do some exploratory data analysis to understand what the uh, data is, okay? and to explore different parts of your features and decide, uh, for example, if you're going to apply KNN as one of your learning algorithms, what is an appropriate distance measure to use, okay? Now in our um, notebook, we also asked you about normalization. Is it always necessary to apply normalization? And the answer is no. Uh, if you believe that the, the values uh, are supposed to be a certain way, again, by knowing your values, okay, knowing your data, and you believe that, that the distinction would be lost after scaling and normalization, then you want to keep it. Okay, but uh, again, if when we do the scaling and normalization, we're basically making some assumption, just like we did smoothing, right? When we did add one smoothing, we're basically saying we have a uniform prior, right? Every case of the data is equally likely, whether you put te or copy in front of me, it's equally likely, right? And uh, that's what we're doing with normalization and scaling here. We're saying each of those features we don't know any better. So we're just gonna make them equally important. Okay, we're gonna normalize and standardize everything to a unit uh, uh, standard deviation and um, uh, a mean of zero, okay? And then we're going to let the data for itself tell the story, okay? We're going to look at the distribution, the spread of that data to decide whether there's outliers, to, to decide whether certain values are more correlated with the output class or not, okay. So um, that basically covers all the things that we wanted to talk about KNN, all right? So I'm gonna end here for a minute and I'm gonna switch. Uh, we're gonna talk about your questions on the Ask Me Anything, all right? Okay, so uh, um, I hope you guys got uh, something out of that part of the quick lecture. It's not so quick, it's 40 minutes, but hopefully that helps you uh, correct, okay. So um, yes, the old probability slide deck is wrong. Uh, so you do need to make sure that you uh, take the current uh, deck. So um, I think it's covered in the email and um, it's also in the materials. If you use the short links that we've advertised, you'll also get the correct deck, okay? 
So uh, I will try to put an announcement later up. I know many of you just rely on uh, getting um, the course homology announcements and email rather than our weekly email, and we'll try to facilitate that where possible. Okay, so let's go to your Ask Me Anything. Okay, I think I need to come out of presentation mode because this software is not particularly smart about changing screen sizes. 